in addition to batch annealing, is continuous online strand annealing. The advantages are as follows. First of all, you can anneal at extremely high temperatures, at extremely short annealing times, at very, very fast speeds. So you can anneal at materials that only take maybe a fraction of a second for annealing. The only problem with strand annealing is because the time is so short, you have to go to much higher temperatures and you can do some surface damage because the wire is so soft. And if you're not careful, if you have some tension on a wire, you can stretch it. And also you have the risk of dissolving some of the impurities, which can have a negative effect. Now here's a graph of some wire that was annealed, batch annealed in a bell annealer. As you can see, the controlling temperature was a thermocouple in the bell over here, and that's what people use. Temperature got up to the point that was needed. In this case, it was 450 Fahrenheit. That's the blue curve, and then it was cooled down. But thermocouples were inserted in different spools inside that bell annealer, both at the top and the bottom of the annealer. And as you can see, the temperature may be off quite a bit maybe 100 degrees or more. So you've got to be very, very careful how much metal is loaded into the bell annealer because it could affect the actual temperature. And this means that sometimes, if you don't do a good job of annealing, there may be a variations of properties from the top to the middle to the bottom of the spool. Now here's an annealing curve for steel. In temperature is plotted on a wick, on the y-axis and the time is plotted on the x-axis. Temperature is more critical than time. As an example, as a rule of thumb, every increase of 10 degrees can cut the annealing time in half. This was for some plain carbon steel and as you can see there are two curves, one for the start of the annealing or recrystallization and one for the end. As you notice though, these are not linear curves, so it's very difficult to predict other times and temperatures with this mode of plotting. So if you want to determine the annealing time for a certain annealing temperature, this particular equation, which is called the Arrhenius equation, applies to every single material that's being annealed, where T is the annealing time, T is the temperature, in degrees Kelvin, R and A are constant, and Q, or activation energy, is the driving force that has to be overcome for annealing process. The reason for using this particular curve is now the annealing process, if you plot it, can result in straight line curves. So for example, this is the information that you get for annealing copper. On the y-axis is the time on a logarithmic scale. On the x-axis on the top is one over the temperature degrees Kelvin. And if you do that, you get straight line plots for different materials. And each curve is dependent upon the amount of cold work. The temperatures are listed down here at the bottom, but that's not on a regular type basis. The regularity is on the one over temperature at the top. So if you plot the graph this way, you can determine how much time you need to anneal if you're going to be at a certain annealing temperature. Now, if you have some wire and you're going to measure the process, the changes during annealing, there's a lot of different ways of measuring it. In most plants, people use tensile elongation. So this curve over here where it says elongation is what you would get if you took the wire that was annealed at a constant temperature for different periods of time. And as you see, you get a typical S-shaped curve. But notice there's a difference if you use different mechanical properties, if you use ultimate tensile strength, if you look at it metallographically, if you measure the yield strength. LSC is low stress elongation, and that's what magnet wire people use. So the thing is you have to be very, very careful 
as to what property you use. For example, if you're annealing and you're using elongation as an indicator of how soft it is, it might seem to you on a basis of elongation that the wire is almost fully annealed. But if you send that to a customer and they're using LSC as an indicator of softness, it will show that the wire is not fully soft for him. So you've got to be very, very careful as to what particular property you're using to indicate the degree of annealing. Now, why is there a difference? Well, if you use resistivity, it measures one thing. For example, it measures point defects. If you use tensile properties, it measures flow stress or dislocations, and that tells you something different. If you're using a calorimeter, something that measures the any energy release, then it measures all kinds of defects that might be present in the cold work material. Now, sometimes if you anneal for too long or too high a temperature, you get a duplex grain size. What I mean is, notice this is some very large grains and there are some very small grains. This happened because after the wire was annealed, it was a nail for either too long a period of time or too high a temperature. If you have a microstructure that looks like this, the elongation will be decreased and it will be inferior because you don't have enough grains in the cross section of the wire. Remember I showed this curve earlier? That means if you used elongation as an indicator, nothing again happens in the recovery stage it increased an S-shaped curve until grain growth took place. But then if you went on too high a temperature and large grains grew, this elongation curve would start to decrease. So you've got to be very careful. If you over anneal and you get low elongation, you've got to know whether the low elongation is because you haven't annealed the wire enough or because you've over annealed it. And so basically, I think with what I've explained, it explained the difficulty and why annealing can be such a complex process. Thank you. Now let's review some key points from the video.